my name is Crispina French and promoting creative textile reuse is my jam. I am an OG textile alchemist, worked my way through art school making ragamuffins from thrift store sweaters way back in the 1980s. That college side hustle grew into a full-fledged business and here I am today to show you how to do it too. Stick around for all the things helping to navigate both the chaotic and dreamy chapters of building your profitable textile upcycling business. We'll talk material sourcing, business savvy, product development, marketing, and self-care. Gloss over the hard parts? Not here. Experience, lessons, and know-how. Deep dive into the struggles, wins, and rewards of running your sustainable textile upcycling business. Think of this as your favorite craft class mixed with environmental business school. Are you ready to be inspired, energized, and supported? This is the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. Are you a textile-centric crafter who loves vintage yardage, unusual fabrics, notions, and sewing tools and tutorials? Maybe you are a sewing teacher in need of cool and inexpensive cloth for students. Whether sewing high-end bespoke couture or experimenting with new textile making processes, SwansonsFabrics.com, located in the heart of Turner Falls, Massachusetts, has just what you need. You can shop online or at the very well-organized and jam-packed store. Swanson's Fabrics is a thrift shop of fabric, notions, and textile tools. It's a community repurposing the leftover collections of home sewers, addressing the reality that we have enough fabric and craft supplies for generations stored right in our very own attics and closets. Swanson's makes it very easy to pass on an excessive fabric stash and find inspirational treasure for sewing projects. Additionally, Katherine Swanson hosts an online group for entrepreneurs interested in using her business model for fabric thrift stores in their communities. Find Swanson Fabrics at swansonfabrics.com and on TikTok and Instagram. Hey guys, this is Crispina French, your happy little podcast host over here. And we are going to kick off part three of the mini series that I am doing with my friend Sarah Stewart, who is actually interviewing me to learn all about how I got here from there. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Hey, this is so fun. Oh, thank you so much. So yeah, you want to just take, oh, you know what? Before we get started, I should remind folks, if you guys are listening to this podcast and you flipping love it as much as I love making it, would you go to Apple Podcasts and rate, review, and subscribe? The more that we get that happening, the more the algorithm will share our stuff across the internet. So that would be awesome. Thanks a bunch. And here we go. Are you ready? Okay. So one of the first things, so we, where we left off last time was you had been, you'd written a book, you had been teaching, you were teaching big brands how to start upcycling their own textile waste and take back their stuff and remake it. And this is a big transition, right? This is a big change from you making stuff that you got at the thrift store. Um, so I want to I want you to talk about that and and I want you to put it in the context for us of of something that you've brought to um the stitcherhood and to some of the kind of little entrepreneur groups of the stitcherhood and tell us how your big why shifted during this phase. Yeah, oh, that's a good question Sarah. Thanks. So Initially, like when I first started way back, I was convinced as, you know, the 19 year old person I was when I started my business that I was going to change the world and I was going to keep people from, you know, wasting materials basically. And that, you know, you seeing the value and not having the, the need or desire to have so many clothes. And as I got more and more into the business and sort of understanding the level of waste in our culture, 
I realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to do that on my own, no matter how big my company grew. Like it would, didn't matter if I was like a multinational corporation, there was going to be need for help. So, um, you know, that was w- uh, working with Eileen Fisher and the other uh, larger volume c- clothing companies that I had done work with really was so exciting to me because I could see that that was going to help and that was going to like bring it into like a larger audience and it was going to become more acceptable for people to th- sort of think differently about their textile consumption. So my big why went from growing my own business and taking on this charge as a as a sole proprietor of a, you know the business to really more of like a knowledge sharer right and more of like uh an empowerer right which sort of spoke directly to that love of teaching right to to watch somebody and i think we talked back in in the first segment that we recorded about how i saw these amazing like beautiful transitions happen with my employees like you know home sewers that didn't realize that they had the skill set that they could develop and i saw that happening with people who i taught and I, I started, so I started, you know, one of the things I heard a lot was like, people couldn't come to my workshops because they couldn't leave home for that long. It was expensive to travel. It was just like inaccessible to a lot of the people who wanted to participate. So it was actually, I think I started teaching online in, I think it was like 2014 or 15. And it was kind of cool, kind of fun. There was this thing called Zoom. Who knew? Like to me, Zoom was a show from the 1970s with a bunch of kids in striped clothing. Do you guys remember that? Like, I don't know. I wasn't alive, Christina. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. I always think everybody's the same age as me, but you know what? They're not. (laughs) So, and actually the funny thing is I never had a television. (laughs) So Zoom was like this special treat, but now Zoom, Zoom is still a special treat, but it's not the same. Yeah. So I started teaching online and seeing that that was a way to have people who were interested in what I was doing, be able to access it without having to travel and spend the money or time away from their regular groove. Um, So I had run this thing um, back when I still had my production company, right towards the end of my production company, I ran this thing called a scrap box challenge. And I had all of, I put, it was like 11 o'clock at night one night and I was really tired and I was like going like, oh my God, I have all this scrap. What am I going to do with it? I want to do something creative with it. So I just put on my Facebook page, Hey, I'm running the scrap box challenge. If anybody wants a box of scrap, let me know. And when I got up in the morning, there was 52 people who wanted a box of scrap. And I was like, what? that's awesome. Wow. And I, um, I, <laughs> I packed up all the scrap of my studio and all these boxes and sent them out across the world to all these different people. And I had this like kind of competition where people could make anything they wanted to out of the scrap box and document their process, send images. And I shared them on the social webs and just like, you know, it wasn't really, there was no real prize. It was just like, Hey, you know, this is kind of cool. Check this out kind of thing. And it, it was really fun. So it had been a success, although I had thought of all these different ideas of ways I could have made it more successful for the next time around. And then I thought, so a few years had passed and I thought, let's do a scrap box challenge again. Let's do that. Cause I, again, had a bunch of scrap that had accumulated. And this time I thought, um, you're going to have to apply and you're going to have to pay me 10 bucks to apply because it costs a lot of money to send 52 boxes of scrap all across the world. And I had over, uh, I think I had over 250 people apply and I had enough scrap to send to 60 people. So I just randomly selected 60 people of my applicants to send a box of scrap to, and they were invited to participate in the scrap box challenge, which was free. And we had meetings every week and, you know, there was like different, we troubleshoot like, what are you making? Oh, I don't know. What are you making? Kind of like it was on Zoom so people could talk to each other. And in the middle, so let me back up a minute. So the boxes were sent out on the 9th of March, 2020, which I remember because that's my mom's birthday. And on the 13th of March, 2020, if you remember, my kids got sent home from school saying we're going to be out of school for two weeks because there's this thing called a pandemic coming. 
So by the time the boxes arrived on people's porches from the UPS guy, we were in lockdown. And those people were like, oh, it was like a lifeline. That box on that porch was like, oh my gosh, holy crap. I can't even believe how lucky I am that I have this community of people that I get to sit with every week on Zoom. So I dragged that stitch, that, that scrap box challenge out as long as I could, because honestly, it was feeding me too. Like I just needed to know that there was like a world beyond the four walls I was sitting inside of that was creative and, and participating in something that was really engaging for me. So when we found that that was a competition, we had voting and everything. We had a winner. We had a first place, second place, third place winner. Um, super fun. Everybody was like really like good natured and friendly and inclusive about it. And, and then I thought the pandemic's still here. Like, what are we doing next? So like most things I do out of thin air, I thought we're going to have a stitch along. <laughs> and I'm like, what's a stitch along? I don't know. <laughs> Let's figure it out. So I thought, you know, I thought, would it, wouldn't it be cool if everybody in the stitch along had like a little kit that they could buy from me and we could make squares that would then be sent back to me and I would make them into a big blanket. And then we would raffle off the blanket or maybe auction off the blanket and give the proceeds to a charity that I would support. So at that time, there was a lot of uh, news about domestic violence and the uptick in domestic violence because everybody was in lockdown. And I'd always really supported our local domestic violence shelter. And I wanted to make sure that um, I could do, I, I could do this. Like I had, I had a tool that I could, I could help them. So I thought, let's do that. Let's support my local shelter. So we had 38 people, I think, participate in that first stitch along and we made a blanket and it was beautiful and it was just so powerful and cool. And everybody, I had 100% participation. Nobody dropped the ball. It was amazing. Sent me back the squares. I made the blanket and we auctioned it off and we made $1,000 for my local shelter. And then somebody who was in that scrap and that stitch along said, let's do another stitch along and let's, let's support a different shelter. And I thought, great, let's do that. So we did another stitch along and that was again, like just really a great way to have people together in a place that was safe without, you know, nobody had to be in close proximity to others, but could share this experience. So that kind of carried us through the pandemic and it was just this really beautiful connection of actually all women. Um, there, there was not a single participant who didn't identify as a woman. So um, just powerful to be women supporting women and having this uh, fun and engaging and traditional connection that uh, spanned pretty much all walks of life and was, you know, supporting another uh, uh, shelter for domestic violence. And it was, uh, we supported a place in White Plains that was suggested by one of our participants who had sat on the board of, um, it's called My Sister's Place, located in White Plains, New York. So that kind of um, made me realize how valuable that community was for me and for the people who participated. Mm hmm yeah. So that, that, you know, the next step out of that was like, okay, so how do I, how do I keep this kind of going and also speak back to my passion to support like people in business, right? Cause business people tend to have more of an impact because they're creating more products so they can change the world faster <laughs> than, um, people who are just making for themselves. So, um, my very first membership grew out of that. And that was, um, that has actually in the years since turned into uh, Stitcherhood, which is our online community for textile upcycling entrepreneurs, where I met you, Sarah. That's right. Yay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So your first community was called Circle. Yep. And because yep. of your background with Dolphin Studio and you'd been hand illustrating your catalogs when you had your business. So your, your first community was, you told me was snail mail based and you were sending things out in the mail, just like you were sending out the 
scrap box challenges. Um, and then, and then you found, you know, through the pandemic found this new, um, channel or way of reaching people, which was, um, the platform that Stitcherhood is on. Um, and I think we should dive into Stitcherhood and some of what's developed since then, but should we take a short break first? Yeah. Yeah. Let's pop a break in right here. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. This episode of the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast is brought to you by The Unruffled. The Unruffled is a vibrant and feminine collection of slow-made garments and accessories handmade with love by Sandra Primo. Sandra is based in Austin, Texas, and every item she makes is thoughtfully constructed from finely sourced, reused textiles, favoring silks and lace and crochet. Bespoke, one of one, encouraging an infinite circle of recovery. Step into the world of The Unruffled at www.theunruffled.com. And visit the show notes page for this episode at rags to riches textile upcycling podcast.com for links and more information. All right, cool. So um, Sarah was, uh, we're back. Sarah was just asking me about um, Stitcherhood, which is our community. When I say our community, I um, started Stitcherhood. It was in, I think it was March or April of. 2021 when I realized that there was like a pretty significant interest in gathering as creative textile upcyclers and um, it grew out of circle which like Sarah said was a membership that I had hosted for just I don't know it wasn't quite a year before that where every month I would send out like a little package of information and you know, creative prompts or whatever. And then we'd meet on Zoom. It was really cobbled together. Um, my members really enjoyed it, but it was sort of cobbled. So I kind of wanted to like make it easier for people to learn about it and to also use it. So um, after doing a lot of research, I came across um, Mighty Networks, which is a platform that we use for the Stitcher Hood, um, the current an uh, iteration of my membership and um, Stitcherhood is really designed to support textile upcycling entrepreneurs, um, whether people have been in business for 25 years and are just looking for that commonality of understanding where, you know, textile upcycling, like all the structure of your business is substantially different than if you're not upcycling material. Or if you're brand new to it, or you're just, you know, you're putting a, you know, ideas together to launch a business uh, from and, and anyone in between is, is really welcome. Um, and it's, I don't know, I just really love it. I would love to hear your questions about it, Sarah. Yeah. So I think I, so I learned about you. I was reading, we moved to New England and we subscribed to Yankee Magazine so that we could learn about New England and and we moved here right before the pandemic started. And so we were like, wow, we moved all the way across the country. And now we can't even go explore really, but at least we can get this magazine that'll tell us all about everything in New England that we can do when the pandemic is over. Uh, and there was an article about you called The Upcycled Life of a 20th, 21st Century Alchemist. And so that's how I first found you. And then... I started following you on Facebook and Instagram and everywhere. And you posted something about, Hey, I'm going to start this new community. And I really want to talk to people who are interested in textile upcycling. And I'm, I'm posting my calendar. You can have a 30 minute conversation with me. And I did. And then I was like, Oh my God, I'm in love with you. And I'm never going to leave you alone ever again. Uh, and then you, you launched Stitcherhood and I joined and, but the community has changed. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, um, it was little and then it just, it, it grows and it grows and new people come in and there's new activities that you're, I mean, not just activities, but like you're cultivating this community and nurturing this community and the people who come and are part of it are 
are helping it become what it is, right? But it's led to new ways for you of kind of answering that big why, which I think is really cool. Like, how else can you get your voice out? How else can you um, inspire other people to do, to grow their own business, to find those own skills for themselves, to earn their own living, all based on this wonderful phrase, textile alchemy. I love that. So what, where Stitcher had started now, what else have you added to the mix? If the community is just there, it's growing. The people there are awesome, but you're not just resting on that. No, it's funny. I don't rest, right? Like that's one thing that I, I realized, especially after talking to you. It's like, and the other thing I just want to interject with is that, I mean, if I do rest, I rest, you know, when I'm, but my, my business mind and my, my sort of path of employment, if you will, has always, you know, I get sick of stuff. I get sick of doing the same thing and I change it because I, I like to be engaged. I like to be challenged. I like to have something to kind of work on and discover and unfold. So, um, initially Stitcher Hood was, um, you know, just a community, a place to go and gather. Right. And now we're introducing something called our thrive squads, which is our small group, um, meetings where people can kind of gather at, at, with other people who are, you know, sharing, you know, their place in their business trajectory. If they've been in business for a very long time or they're just getting started and have like that really more intimate sort of, uh, almost like masterminding group. We also have, um, like members of the month that we feature each month, we have uh, stitch hours and we have book recommendations and we do a challenge every month that has like fun prizes that people can win. And it's just a lot of um, camaraderie really. And that that's maybe something that I'd like to just shine a little light on um, for a minute. And, you know, having been in the clothing industry, the fashion industry um, for a little while there, like, you know, a few years where, you know, most people in the fashion industry are very, uh, well, the fashion industry in general is very fickle, right? Like things change on, you know, a dime or people try to, you know, copy each other, or there's always this like, you know, like kind of a secret hidden, like, don't look at my stuff. It's not out there yet. Like, it's always like, you know, who's going to introduce this silhouette first or whatever. And it's just, I, I just don't care for that type of mentality. It's very competitive and unfriendly. And in textile upcycling, it's sort of the opposite because everybody's goal is the same. Like everybody just wants to use the stuff we've got. They're not interested in like one upping each other. They're more interested in like, supporting each other. And I feel like that is really kind of the, the peer that kind of holds Stitcher Hood down is like this, this collective uh, desire for everyone to find success and connection and uh, support. So with that said, um, I back in, I think it was 2006, I had this idea that I really wanted to have a way to bring textile upcyclers together. And I thought at the time, I thought it was going to be in person and have like an annual like Congress of like textile upcycling creatrixes that could come together and just like put their heads together and present their businesses and teach each other about what they were doing and share resources and just have this place and time and space where this could happen. And, um, whatever, ha you know, life gets busy, didn't happen. But I always had this thought in my head where I could just like create this connection for people. So last year, um, and so if you're not listening to this in uh, real time, it's going to be like in 2022, I came up with this idea. Actually, it was 2021 when I thought of it. I was going to have a summit. And I thought, I want to have a summit. And like the stitch along, I'm like, what's a summit? <laughs> I don't know. Let's figure it out. So the, the idea was to have that happen, right? Like that collective place where all these people could come together. And it was my idea was to have it be completely virtual so that it didn't cost a ton of money to, to participate. But it also didn't tax the environment because air travel is so taxing on our environment. And so 
to invite people from all over the world to come together and share their experience and um, resources in a way that would benefit everybody in attendance. So um, Summit, uh, you know, Rags to Riches 2022 happened in April and it was a resounding success. Everybody who participated really enjoyed it. And I loved it. I love to have the opportunity to connect with people who I hadn't really necessarily needed to connect with in a long time, but were still in the field doing cool work. I'd been following people and now I had this beautiful opportunity to have reason to connect with them. So um, that was really fun. And to put together the summit, I connected with 50 different people who I interviewed. And I thought, after the summit was over and I was like taking a giant rest exhale, like, oh my God, that was amazing. I thought if I had saved all of those recordings of all of those interviews, I could have a podcast for a whole year. (laughs) So here we are. (laughs) And so you went back and talked to those people again, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of them I did. A lot of my very first guests were people who I had, um, actually who had participated in, um, the Rex to Riches Summit the first, um, year. And now, you know, we're busily putting together our event for this year and, um, you know, that will be coming up in May for 2023. And, you know, my plan is to just continue hosting the Rags to Riches Summit annually. And, um, just keep growing the movement this year, the event, the summit, it will be free, which is, I think a huge improvement. Sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to kind of wrap my head around the business model that serves best. So, you know, if you've listened to the past couple of sessions, um, that we've put together in this little, um, three part series, you know, that, my business was founded because I needed to make money. (laughs) So I was thinking like, how could I possibly host a summit for free? Like how would that even work? But that's what I'm doing this year because I feel like it will work really nicely. There'll be opportunity for people to purchase recordings or get the VIP pass, which will have lots of different bonuses. But bottom line is anybody can attend for free. And I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I'm really excited about it too. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, making it accessible is so important from the beginning of your story. You've talked about, you know, you're working with these people that the state of New York considers unemployable. And so, you know, I think the, the goal, right. With this is that people can make a living upcycling textiles, even, um, you know, no matter where they are in their, whether they're going to be handcrafting from home or whether they're going to be, you know, the next mega Eileen Fisher. Um, and that building these com- connections and, you know, you, you touched on how on kind of the community of the Citrahood and, and, and I, I, I on how, non-competitive it is and how welcoming it is. And I think that that has certainly been my experience that, you know, the people that I'm connecting with are doing such vastly different things. The members of the Stitcherhood, you know, somebody is focused on yoga apparel and somebody else is working on things for, um, you know, like the bike courier community, bike messengers. And, um, some people are making, uh, you know, garments and some people are making house goods, you know, home goods. And some people are working to be the sourcers for all of, you know, like here, I'm going to bring together all of these vintage fabrics, dead stock fabrics and, and, and be a source where other, other people can get what they need. Um, so it really is just this, but everybody's cheering each other on, you know, like it is not like, oh, these people, we all have this common interest in the textiles being used, dead stock, manufacturer's waste, used clothing, old linens, whatever it is. It's not, it's not new fabric from Joann's. 
Um, and that unites us all together and everybody is going, wow, what did you make? Oh, that's so beautiful. And then, you know, coming together and saying, oh, I'm struggling with this right now. What should I do about this? And people really pitching in, really spending time and energy to help solve those, those dilemmas that people are having with their business and with their, with their making. Um, and I think the, the summit is just going to take that to like, Ooh, whole new, whole new level. Yeah. And like the idea of it to, um, just do what you just said, actually, it's, I think that you summed it up really nicely just to say that, you know, there'll be over 30 professional people from the textile upcycling industry sharing their experience, their knowledge and their resources so that we can, as a, as a group build momentum in our movement to actually change the way that we consume textiles. And, you know, sometimes people sort of go down this rabbit hole of like, oh, that means that I can't have what I want, or that means that I have to compromise my creative dressing style or my fashion forward look. And actually, in reality, I kind of feel like using textile upcycling as kind of like the the thread of how you are and how you dress really builds on your creative expression, right? Because you're, you're then thinking about ways to, you know, maybe restyle garments that you own or, you know, in in the way that you put them together, or maybe it means that you're actually like cutting things up that you owned that, you know, don't fit the way you want them to, or, you know, that length of that particular garment might not be the right length for you today, but it was when you first um, got it in, you know, whatever uh, time frame that might've been. And it, it kind of presents this level of creativity that is uh, maybe overlooked, right? And, it, and actually that sort of speaks as well to the process involved in running a textile upcycling business where, you know, if you're making clothing or home goods from fabrics that you're purchasing, there's like this sort of finite amount of creativity that you have in that business. Whereas when you're able to open your mind and see textile waste as this uh, treasure of creativity, you, you know, for instance, like if you're making picnic blankets out of denim jeans, like I'm doing this afternoon, you know, the placement of all those different blues that you're using and the way that you cut those pieces so they fit together is always creative. It's never stops. The creativity is every step of the process is creative. And then you also end up with something that's not exactly the same, even if it's repeatable, even if you're able to make a hundred denim blankets out of denim jeans that are all pretty similar, each one is different. So there's this level of meaning and creativity and connection that happens in this work that is, uh, that's just intrinsic to this work. It's not, you know, it's like this, this magical beauty that is sort of like the secret that people who are not uh, participating in it don't know what they're missing. (laughs) Honestly. I think that there's, that's been something in my textile upcycling journey that, you know, the importance of textiles throughout human history and and how labor intensive they were in the past, you know, before the pre-industrial revolution, the process of collecting whatever it was, the wool or the linen and turning it from its raw material into thread and then weaving it into fabric and then taking that fabric and turning it into clothing. Um, and that, you know, clothing was, a way of carrying wealth through generations um, and had such significance and such value because it was so difficult to make. And what I love, one of the things I love about textile upcycling is exactly what you're talking about is like giving the value back to these textiles. And I think you see that a little bit in like the people who make, you know, t-shirt quilts, where, or, or other kinds of memory quilts where they're like, these were significant 
things like here's your baseball jersey from when you were six and here's you know or here's grandpa's shirts or whatever it gives it it highlights that value that textile has the textiles have in our lives and fabric has for humanity Mm -hmm. and i think that you just touched on that so beautifully uh that that is something that is part of this community and part of this movement that is so uniquely special and so uniquely human and intimate. Um, so I'm so grateful that you're, I'm so grateful that you're driven to create this community where we, people who feel this way can kind of come together. Awesome, Sarah. That's so nice. I think that is a really nice way to wrap up our series. I really appreciate your taking the time to do this. And I, it's so much more fun to have you interview me than it would be for me to sit down and try to figure out like, what do people actually want to learn about what I did? And like, what is it really that cool? I don't know. So thank you. So here's the question. Okay. My last question. Okay. Okay. I mean, this is time, this is time relevant. So if you're listening to this podcast, like way off in the future, well, some of it'll still be relevant, but my question is here we are. It is March 16th. So tomorrow is St. Patty's Day for anyone who wants to wear green, wear some upcycled green. Um, (laughs) March 16th, 2023. You can't register yet for the summit, but you can. What are the things you can do right now if you're dying to get involved with uh, more textile upcycling? Oh, great question. So, yeah, and I think you're right. I think this is you know, for this year, this year's summit will be held um, May 17th, 18th and 19th. Um, so if you are somebody who works during the day, get time off. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's going to be awesome. You can get on the wait list by going to my website, which is crispina.eco. You can also check out Stitcherhood. And actually, Stitcherhood is accessible from the same website. So crispina.eco and... um top navigation, click that little stitcher hood button and you can check it out for two weeks and see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, if it's something that you love, great. You can stay with us. It costs $10 monthly. Or if it's something that you just don't find you you're using, you can just opt out. And actually you can opt out at any time. There is no like long-term commitment and believe it or not, we're people. So if you have an issue where you want to opt out and you forgot and you got charged 10 bucks, like let us know and we can actually help you. Um, we don't, I don't even know how to use a bot. So I don't even know like that. Like we're going to, if you reach out to us, one of us will get back to you and help you sort any anything that might be an issue out. And of course, you can listen to this podcast. We release episodes of this podcast every week on Mondays and If you can subscribe to it, share it, give it a rating and a review, that just helps more people get our message. And it's really helpful for us to just know that our our material is valuable. So um, those are some nice ways to get involved um, today. And the other thing that we didn't mention, Sarah, that I'd like to just give a little plug to before we go is uh, we're building something called the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Directory. And it's actually housed within within Stitcherhood. And it is a listing of people and businesses who are upcycling textiles, what they are upcycling, what they are generating that might be available for other people to upcycle, where they're selling their product if you're interested in purchasing things, and how to connect with those people if you want to collaborate. So anybody who is a member of Stitcherhood ha- has an opportunity to have a free listing in our directory. And everybody who's in Stitcherhood has access to that directory. So whether you're actually currently upcycling or if you're a business that generates textile waste of any kind and you would like to have that be upcycled by someone, it's a really good way to jump into a pool of super creative, um, just collaborative, community-minded people who might be able to help you along that journey. So that is, I think, the ways that I that come to mind for connection. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad you mentioned the directory. And when and I want to say, when you talk about like manufacturers who are making any kind of textile waste, you really mean it. Like we have someone in Stitcherhood who makes amazing things out of cotton rope. 
like that her whole business is using cotton rope. So, you know, it's not just fabric, it's, you know, all things textiles. And so go to the website, crispina.eco and Stitcherhood is there Mm -hmm. and the summit is there and the podcast is there and you can reach out through that website and just ask if you're like, how do I get into the directory again? All those stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, one thing that is a little bit like time, not sensitive, but it we're doing right now in March of 2023 is, um, we have a stitch along that's actually in process right now that, um, is supporting a quilting studio for G spend quilters in G spend Alabama. So you can learn more about that on the website as well. And, you know, we will continue to do stitch alongs um, along the way, and uh, we will always be supporting. Um, I think going forward, we'll be supporting organizations that speak more directly to textile upcycling in general. So, um, yeah, check it out. Come visit and let me know um, what you think. You know, comment, share, subscribe, stay in touch. We love you guys. Thank you so much, Crispina. This has been so fun. Hey, so I'm over here and I'm serving you a giant air hug because you just finished another episode of the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. Thank you for being with me. Our music is provided by The Lucky Five. Learn more about them at theluckyfive.com. Our show is produced and edited by Van Hyacin. If you want to dive in deep, head over to Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast.com.